Um, my Polish is not great. I can only say Yash Mash. Uh, but I'm going to try it. Very you good. Know, that's not bad, right? <laughs> it's a start. Uh, but I'm going to try to speak very slowly so, you know, make the job of the translator in the back uh, quite easy. Before I jump into today, you know, it's quite exciting. I see a lot of opportunity in finance. Uh, now the PSC2 actually is in force. Let's see what's going to happen on the back of the PSC2. For this presentation, I'll focus in, in London, because uh, that's where you got so that's where you guys here to figure out a bit more about. Uh, but before that, I'll take you guys through myself. So I've been working in finance now for over a decade. I worked in the industry like banking, insurance, asset management, you know, lots of funds as well. And I found that always looking at the ways to do finance differently has helped me evolve through my career, right? So it brought me now to what we talk about connected finance. That's the area really that I put my all the, my effort into. So what is connected finance? A lot of people might ask what is convergence, right? So when you look at these three different areas, uh, you're going to say uh, they all the time in silos. So banking is treated as banking, asset management is treated as asset management, funds is treated as funds. But in the future, we're going to see actually with technology, the emergence and coverages of the tree coming together. And that led me to FinTech. That was my past life. I started a FinTech company and exited that FinTech company as well. Uh, and now I'm in Graham Thornton building the actual FinTech department from scratch from the ground up because we see it as an opportunity to develop a new market in advisory, uh, but mostly actually to help the industry understand what's happening around them at the moment, right? So this is a quote that I love, right? What it actually is saying, Jack, there is, if the rate of change outside is outpaces the rate of change inside, then it's here, right? But I don't think it's about bleak end. Uh, I think always the positive stand of things. I think it's about us looking at ways to do business in a different manner. That is the opportunity that is ahead of us with online. We talked a bit about e-commerce here and how lending is happening online. But everything nowadays is actually happening online. You know, how do you capture that opportunity that is in front of you and to look at things in a different way, in a different manner? So that's the beauty of the era that we're moving in. I think 2020 could be quite exciting if we look at it from the opportunity standpoint. So now we're going to talk about tech. You know, I think you guys are bored with all these big words uh, that's been thrown around with no meaning and you know, no, no deep insights, right? But big data has been for, around for a long while, right? Social media, when it started, I was incredibly excited about it. Uh, fundamentally, because you can understand your customer at a deeper level and have more touch points with your customer. So back then, a lot of people would started mining that data in finance. I was one of those people who looked a lot at social media data, like the Facebook, uh, and ended up, you know, the past years as well, looking at like Instagram data. And now we're looking at opportunities around TikTok. Uh, could be another way where we can gather some very, very insights on this new generation, how they will interface and connect with finance, right? So big data has been there. You got a lot of insights. You model the data in one particular shape, right? So that, that has been there for a while, right? But now with connectivity, what we call Internet of Things, now you can gather this data passively. So just to give you an example, in, in my previous life, I worked a lot with wearable data, so the likes of uh, uh, Fitbits that everyone has uh, on their hands. So you can use those type of data sets like heart rate, sleeping patterns, you know, your calories, to underwrite price and reserve better. Also, you can use that for risk scoring, so you can do some very, very alternative dynamic on the right with that in, in London in particular. So now, not only you're the right individual, uh, let's say for London, when you actually provide a loan, you can continuously on the right them through the process of 10, 12 years, how many years actually the book of London is, right? So uh, now I've packaged this tree into one, right? Because if you're doing uh, them in silence, it does not make sense. You really have to do it. You know, all this technology amalgamated they want. So RPA is robotic process automation. Uh, that's where I think that's would be the big, big buzzword. The big, that's where the activities happen uh, the most of the past uh, you know years, whereby you actually automate you know, taking a lot of the processes that would need out of the actual flow, right? So that that has been an element where I really really enjoy working because human beings should spend their time really thinking about things than keen. Uh, things around, right? So that is uh, an area that you know shows a lot of potential, a lot of growth, a lot of opex, you know, operational efficiencies there. 
Uh, and now we're moving into the likes of machine learning. Machine learning is, is where you actually understand this insight a skill and you continuously you know, gather this data, learn, iterate, learn, iterate. AI is still very, very early days. Um, if anyone tells you that they have the best AI engine is going to help you, you know, solve all your problems, you know, uh, close the door, run away. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I, I would say. I think it's in its infancy. And you can see even like how this AI is being trained by humans, right? So there's an example whereby, you know, in order to, for a human being to understand what cat is, a key looks at the human being once and you understand what that is a, a cat, right? If you, the key is looking at the cat. If you want to train an AI, you have to take over 10 million images, you know, to actually get that AI to that speed, right? So uh, you can do very interesting things with AI, but it's not a level that we would like to, to be in the industry itself, right? Blockchain has been tossed around, uh, you know, big boss world. If, you if you're in fintech and you want to raise a lot of money, just put blockchain on the deck. That has been <laughs> a kind of a, a premises, but that's coming to an end as well. Uh, I think the seriousness of, of this is what people are understanding. That it's not about big boss words, uh, it's not about the technology. It's really like, what is that technology enabling you to do, right? So a lot of people will be looking at these technologies in silos as well, coming back the way that we look at finance, you know, insurance, asset management, banking, where people look at it also, these technologies, they looked at them in silos. So they looked at big data, then they look at internet things, they look at, you know, machine learning AI, and then they look at likes of blockchain in silos, right? So what I'm saying here with this conference is about connectivity, right? So you have to look at it as a stack. So if you're doing anything in finance, be it lending for these particular purposes, you should stack all these technology together. So if you don't have a roadmap which incorporates all this, you're already losing, you're already behind, right? Because uh, you can do big data without thinking about blockchain, you can really do blockchain without internet of things, etc. All this is interchangeable, and you have to look at your roadmap and how you could constantly iterate on this roadmap itself, right? So this is the beauty of, uh, of the era that we live in, particularly in 2020. You can actually layer a lot of this technology, even the blockchain start playing with it, like so for, you know, this real edge technology, that, that's where it is really at. So there's two different things, uh, there's the blockchain and the distributed edge technology itself, right? But for this conference, I wanted to focus on really, really life cycle, the, the, what I call the, the actual iteration of where the lifestyle moments are, right? So I'm looking at this from a retail standpoint and also from an institutional <coughs> standpoint. If you really want to understand your consumer and underwrite on the fly, you really have to pinpoint the moments of the life cycle and continuously iterate on the life cycle itself, right? So you start with borrowing. That's one element of the life cycle. That's where you guys are. You got more on the borrowing, borrowing side of things, which uh, is, is quite interesting. And it could be the massive opportunity there for my, for my belief uh, as, as an area of growth. Pay uh, is another element of the life cycle as well, right? You know, how do I pay the efficiencies, you know, during pain, and also myself lend it out, right, as a payer. Uh, saving, um, you know, is, 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 a, is a given one. A lot of people have targeted savings as an ecosystem, as a bit strong. Investing, there will be a lot of people who are coming into the investing in part and protecting, right? So if you look at this life cycle, now you understand uh, the opportunities where they are at. So that's, this is where you, you really should segregate. So if you want to really you know, zoom in and own the process, you could look at uh, the chain and really zoom in. And I call it tokenization moments, because this, uh, this is where you start looking at your processes and pairing all that technology in, right? Uh, and then you iterate and you focus more, and, and that's how you really get a piece of the jigsaw going, right? But uh, I, I put the title here, Open Finance 2020, is, is this a question, right? Um, I, I, don't, I know a lot of people are still are skeptical about PSD2, uh, but if you don't look at it, you're going to be left behind. So it's, for me, it's not really a question. The question is like, how do you use this opportunity to curate a great experience, be it in lending, be it in borrowing, be it in paying, be it in protected, uh, be it in savings, right? So that's where the opportunity is really. It's like curating these experiences. And I've been talking about all this technology and how it's deployed, and I'm going to show you where is the methodology behind it, right? So, for uh, big banking, as an example, so all these fintechs, they go in and they target specific areas of the ecosystem, right? So, I always break it into four areas. So, on, the, on this side, you see the traditional players, uh, traditional institutions, and we're focused on banking, look at what the traditional you know, institutions are being unbundled, how they're being unbundled, right? So, 
even in banking, this is like an ecosystem, it's an old slide, probably you've seen it before. So they are bonding bank in different verticals, right? But this is happening also across the different uh, areas. All, all these verticals here are on this side. So this is happening in insurance, it's happening in asset management, it's happening in the funds also uh, system. What's happening is the fintechs are coming in and involving the services that focus in our and providing a great user experience, leveraging the technologies that we spoke about. So for lending, uh, pull the slide just up off the internet as well. You can see how you know they went in and they're kind of chopping up, chopping about as well uh, the lending ecosystem, right? So it's interesting because um, all of them have different value propositions for all that five pieces of the life cycle that we saw earlier. So you can see how this can become very cumbersome if you want to really keep a pace uh, with what is happening. But the beauty of it, you own bundle and then you bundle back in, which is, I think that's the part that is excited, should be exciting everyone. Because all these fintechs are going targeting specific verticals, right? And they're creating great, great experiences. But what you can do as a, as a traditional institution is say, okay, I like this experience here, I like that experience there, I like that experience there, and you create your own experience. You don't need to really, uh, you know, try and re reinvent things that are already there. So I'll give the Uber example, but this could be uh, examples, you know, across other tech players. Uber didn't build uh, Uber from scratch, right? This is API based, so they connect the different APIs and they show you an experience on the front end that you believe Uber built from scratch, but they didn't, right? So the likes of uh, infrastructure, Amazon, Twilio communication, send great emails, but the way they layer the experience in front of you, it makes the beautiful, seamless, uh, it, and they get you as a customer, right? So uh, in your company, you should think, how can I leverage this new ecosystem, these new APIs, to build incredible experiences for my customer, that they enjoy what they're doing. Uh, and by enjoying what they do, they trust me more, they share more data with me, and I get more of that pieces of that life cycle. So a piece of life cycle, by like, again, the borrowing, the saving, the protecting, the investing, uh, you know, how do I get more of that chain? Uh, and gather more data, more insights. So that's what it, it really should be about. So this is one, uh, but I want to show you guys in real life how that actually works. Uh, I always refer back to the Amazon uh, marketplace. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So, how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual card and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. the technology, how Amazon layered all that big data, IoT, you know, machine learning, and they build an awesome experience. This is coming to finance now, because uh, now the, the actual genie is out of the box, right? It's just a, how do you build this experience uh, and, you know, bring it to your customer. You're missing the trick if you don't uh, start thinking about it this way, because there are other people out there that are thinking about it this way. Right? Uh, and that's what it re is the part that is really, really exciting. You can do this in finance. Like, so I'm going to put some people here on the, on the screen just to give you guys some ideas. Uh, but it, it, I'm not biased towards these companies. There are other companies that do great things. And you know, the likes of uh, 
this one's here, and I said I'll, I'll pop it in uh, just to give you guys a, an idea of what we call elegant simplicities of creating experiences, right? Even like Lemonade is not there, I think Lemonade is a great company, working with your behavioral analytics, right? So Revolut, I think everyone knows Revolut, everyone that's been known, Robin Hood, uh, Robin Hood, I think the interesting part is that it flipped the model on its head, you know, whereby they say, I would actually monetize the data and I'm gonna not charge fees. You know, imagine if you could do lending and not even charge for interest rates, you can, you know, try and get data on the back end to actually be your engine, right? Uh, but I want to focus on Folio, likes of uh, and financial and others. So, uh, Dreams is a very, very interesting company for me because they work on behavioral economics and behavioral analytics uh, to provide lending and, and savings and, you know, provide your dream, right? So the way they went about it is that you actually can have different boxes in what you want to do and, and then they help you actually get to your dreams. So they gamify the whole process uh, of, you know, savings and, and, and lending out. So this is a, just one example, I was Scandinavia. After a year, AXA heavily invested in them because AXA sees an opportunity that is quite, you know, is quite visible. And this is how the next generation will think. Um, you know, they will want to gamify finance and they will interact uh, with finance in a different manner. And the way you have to transfer between funds is an interesting mechanism as well on, on, on dreams. But it's all driven about, about behaviors and how, when you interact with the app, how many touch points you have with the app, and then it can actually you know, influence some of your behavior. So I think that's an interesting space to look into. Folio, Folio is out of uh, Asia. I, I think this is an incredible company because they, if you look at what they're doing behind the scenes in the fund space, uh, it could be very, very, very exciting. So uh, they can ask you to pick uh, a team, right? And so you pick a team, it could be dogs, it could be sushi, it could be whatever you, know, you choose as a team, right? What, what is actually meaningful to you, because money is not meaningful to anyone really, it's what you do with money, that's what it's meaningful really. Uh, so let's say I pick the sushi, right? So now I can invest in sushi companies around the world, right? Because I like sushi, let's say if I like sushi. Um, and then not only I can invest in those companies, they can put now this user ledger technology behind the funds. They can actually trace the sushi itself, right? Now they gamify the whole process, which is interesting for me because not only I trusted the company uh, that you know I'm going to put like 10% of my portfolio in sushi. Now I can see does that type of portfolio manager is putting that money well, and the companies that invest in the sushi companies are they actually ethical? You know, when they process etc. Et so you can see how that becomes very very powerful, and the technology at the back end, uh, you know, is really the, the engine, uh, you know, for the whole experience, right? So this one is an interesting one. Uh, people started here. This is like a robot advice. Uh, for me, robot advice is, uh, you know, something of the past whereby you categorize, you know, you depend on your behavior and your insights to change and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, they do it more interesting things than, uh, uh, than was from the past itself, right? And financial was a very, very interesting fund. Very, very interesting fund. And I always bring this one back because this one is where it really hits home, right? Um, so they did what they call micro and so you can spare cash, Revolut is doing it now, but uh, this guy started way back. Whereby, you know, let's say I buy something automatically, let's say it was like 4.50 slotted, automatically it's like around 50 cents uh, or 50, you know, whatever it on slot, it rounds it up and, and it puts it by investing, right? You know? So I'm dynamically investing on the fly with every purchasing behavior, right? You can do this in London as well, you know, the matters, right? But, but this fund became the biggest money market fund, you know, surpassing the likes of Goldman Sachs uh, and others, you know, in a, because it was the power of the population investing at the same time, right, as scale, right? So this is like a standard of the joke, people say, oh, you know, this spare cash round is a 10, right? But it became one of the biggest money market funds due to gamification, the insights, and then how they launched the individuals actually to, to save, uh, which was, it was interesting. I want, round, I want to round up quickly because I know my time is being called up. <laughs> so I'll accelerate this piece a bit. So on your journey, you should really look at is, is this, this roadmap. You know, if you have an idea, fantastic, you start from scratch. If you don't have an idea, you have a product, you know, you're saying, saying okay, how do I take my product into an experience, right? 
Uh, so you have a single product, uh, it's fine. Taking a product with experience, uh, is, that's where it becomes really, really complex, right? Well, even taking a product to service, how do you take a product to service? So you have a lender, so and then you can put a platforms around your core product, uh, and then it, it becomes a service, so you move your product into a service. But ultimately, like, how do you move your service into an experience is what I've been showing you guys today uh, through the you know, 20, 15 minutes, 20 minutes that we've been here. So this is the roadmap uh, that uh, we focus on. I think moving a product to a service with experience is something that's going to be very, very prevalent in, in uh, 2020. And it's already happening. Uh, but fundamentally, there's a methodology to also do this. So this is one of the methodologies that we have at Brent uh, whereby we look at uh, you know, different services and we say, okay, how do we really help our clients you know, enable and mobilize, mobilize um, you know, move the needle for, forward, right? So behind this is, is more complex, uh, you know, this is just a, a roadmap itself. And I know my, I'm cautious of time, so I won't go through it. But you can look at yourself, how, where you're in the circle, and how you circle back, and you can do this with different products, different services. Uh, if you're experienced, fantastic, you, you know, even better. But I'll see a lot of people who be on the, on the manual stage, uh, on the mainframe, depending on what you're you actually in, and lending a lot of it, still, there's a lot of paperwork there, and then you try and work yourself around the circle itself, right? I'll be here up to lunchtime, so feel free to guide me for a chat. Uh, I'm going to leave here my details. It'll be a pleasure joining you guys here out of Dublin. Uh, and I hope to you know, continue the conversation over the next hours. Thank you. Appreciate it.